kind of a sustainability nerd, um, and I got into doing startups because I was studying climate science, and it was really depressing, and I would rather find ways to fool people into making positive decisions. That's kind of my goal in life, is that we get positive lifestyle choices that people don't even <laughs> consciously make on an ongoing basis, because if you're anything like me, you have lots of good intentions, whether it's like gym time or savings or whatever it may be, but if you have to think and do it over and over again, it doesn't necessarily continue to happen on a regular basis. So I like the idea of making easy buttons where someone makes a positive choice once, it just keeps going. And it requires inputting energy to get off the treadmill of a, of a holistically positive decision. And that was a lot of the uh, genesis of something good was our goal was to make an easy button for eating local, supporting small family farms, getting the highest percentage of your food dollar possible to the person who actually grew your food, and making that scale. Um, so I guess the, the slideshow that I put together is really short, it's only eight slides, I can't tolerate long and PowerPoints, and I just want to talk a little bit about what's broken in the local food system. Um, so, there's a really nice thing oh, in the way, which is this is farmers markets. I couldn't find the last couple of years, but it, it keeps going up. This is farmers markets in the US. We have this huge trend. If you've hung around Boston the last couple of years, you've seen this. The number of farmers markets just go up and up and up, and it seems like this wonderful thing that we're all getting engaged in local food and really participating in that system. The challenge with that is that uh, this might be a little harder to see from the back, but this is the number of acres of cropland in every county in Massachusetts that are actually being farmed to produce food. At the exact same time, that's dropping. The, there's lots of reasons for this. Uh, my take on it is, is we don't have an effective means of competing with traditional agriculture and large-scale food distribution for small local farms. And while the farmer's market is a fantastic place, it's really fun and it's community driven and you love going and hearing the stories and seeing where your food comes from, the economics of it just do not make a lot of sense to the people who actually go and do these every single day. They're making less sense the more of these markets we have because people just have to attend a lot more of these as a vendor to make the same food dollars. Uh, this is a study from 2012. There's actually uh, a wonderful PhD dissertation from a woman in t at Tufts, uh, Jennifer Obadiah, I'm gonna butcher her last name, but she went through and she studied every single farmer's market in Massachusetts, and she found the following. Almost half the people who do this sell less than $250 a day at a market. So that's like the average cart at a Whole Foods in Beacon Hill. And so how is it that they're supposed to run a farm, attend seven of, of these markets a week, seven days a week, because there's really that many now. Like our, uh, our beef suppliers, uh, our old ones, uh, Lilac Hedge, they did over 20 markets a week in order to make a viable business out of selling local food direct to consumer. And it's really hard to make that work. Even if you're willing to put in the work of running a farm, which I think we all can accept is really challenging, Getting that to market in a way that actually makes sense as a business is, is hard. And it's not getting better. Um, it's actually getting harder the more of these markets that occur. So what's the other option? It's a grocery store. So you go sell to Whole Foods. This is the holy grail of a lot of the food startups that we work with. It's something good is, if I can just get into Whole Foods, I've got it made. Well, this is, this is actually from a uh, from an infographic about Walmart that came out a couple years ago, but the, the numbers roughly hold true. This is the percentage of dollars that actually get to the farmer from what you spend at a grocery store. And it's going down dramatically with time, and it's not an amount that if you were selling small amounts of food, like not factory farming scale, you could ever make money on. So this is why the small farm is dying. Even though we have a lot of enthusiasm and good intentions and we all really want to make a difference in how we shop, there's just not an efficient way of connecting A to B, of consumer desire to this directly. Because if you're going to get 10 cents on the dollar, 20 cents on the dollar, 30 cents on the dollar for selling something, 
you have to be at a really big scale to make that make any sense. And that's why there's if uh, the same infographic, which you can find online, just Google the Walmart taking over food system. They sell 25% of all food in the US. Groceries are sold through Walmart now. It's crazy, and that's growing. Um, so anyway, all sorts of depressing stuff. This is the percentage of each dollar that was spent in 2014 at something good that goes directly to the person who grew your food. And that's more than double, it's almost three times, depending on the type of food, of what they would get if they sold to a retailer, and certainly better than if they sat all day at a farmer's market and tried to sell one steak at a time and had to tell their story in order to sell one piece of fruit, one steak, one whatever it might be. And so whether it's, it's something good or whether it's another decision, we need to find ways to make it so that these businesses can compete with highly subsidized, highly mechanized, fantastically large agribusiness. And so we need to start digging for efficiency. The way that we've done this and managed to actually make it make financial sense is we came up with a model um, through lots of trial and error where people place orders with us a couple days in advance. We don't buy things and arrange cosmetically perfect pyramids of apples in the hopes that it will come and inspire you to buy them. You guys say, I want food, and then we go get you the food and we bring it to your house. And in that way, we pretty much eliminated food waste. 40% of all the food grown in the US goes out in the trash. We don't have it. So as a result, we're able to pay a lot higher percentage of each dollar to those farmers, to those food makers, to the people who are making awesome prepared meals like Tegan and Kelsey. Um, you guys have that dinner? That's where you're supposed to have it. And because of communities like this that are really interested in these types of ventures, like we're really fortunate to be in a place like Somerville, because here in Austin and about 10 other cities, you can actually, through pure word of mouth, grow a business like this, and instead of spending your money on advertising, spend it on your suppliers. So we've been really blessed to be able to do that in a way that actually made sense almost from day one economically. So I'm not saying that this is the perfect model, but what I'm saying is that we need to really be creative if we're gonna figure out how to make this make economic sense to grow a, a, a robust local food system because transportation is gonna get more and more expensive over time. Getting food from all around the world the way we do. You know, I think we've all seen different numbers in this, but something like 1,800 miles that the average bite of food travels before it crosses your plate. And that's just not going to work in a world of finite fossil fuels and resources. And I think we all kind of accept this, or a lot of us do. Um, but we need to find ways to bridge that gap. And so whether it's buying your dinners from folks like Tegan and Kelsey at the community canteen, who are actually doing that local sourcing wherever they can. Same with Peter Ungar right down here at the end, about to open a tasting counter in like the next couple of weeks and make some of the most amazing all locally sourced food you possibly can. There's a lot of people doing really neat things with this, and I think that we need to seek out interesting, adventurous ways of doing it, and, and also have a healthy skepticism when we see the, the idea of local food. You know, I love Taza as much as the next guy, and we sell Taza, I think it's a great company, but a lot of farmers markets are stuff sourced from all over the earth and then marketed as local food, next to people selling vegetables they actually grew here. And I think that we need some healthy skepticism. I'm not going to try to talk anyone out of eating chocolate, but the things where we can make genuine substitutions with a locally sourced product, I think we should start to look at that much more seriously. Um, okay, so why don't you walk us through uh, starting something good? What did you, you know, what were the steps that you went through to get it? get it off the ground, what were the key milestones? Sure, um, so we started showing up at farmer's markets at the end of the day and saying, can I buy all of that for less than you normally sell? Because otherwise you have to throw it out or take it home. And so that was how we started something good, um, was just hustling farmer's markets for ourselves and a group of our friends. So you know, our first 50 customers were like immediate family, neighbors, friends, and ourselves. And so we tried to serve that market. And you know, thankfully, that's a market that's willing to give you very direct feedback, very openly and honestly, about what you're doing well and badly. Um, 
and you know there's a lot of like food is a really intimidating highly regulated thing to get into the, the, the hoops that you have to jump through to do anything in food are kind of extraordinary the permitting that you have to go through in order to pick up a vegetable here and hand it to someone down the street is counterproductive in my mind uh, but I'll just say like arduous um, so learning that learning the regulatory framework of what you can do and can't do and why it is that we can't deliver beer even though that would make it really easy to sell food to people if you were delivering them steaks and beer uh, because some Puritans <laughs> decided that would be a bad idea a few hundred years ago um, you know navigating that is a really challenging uh, thing and then I don't know, just trying to find white space, trying to actually serve a need that's not being met is always challenging and you, you make tons of mistakes. Um, uh, so in terms of how we wound up physically here, that guy um, and I <laughs> went to a talk by the guy who started Boston Organics, which is like, what's that? Stop advertising for them. Um, Anyway, so they, they are the um, always organic, sometimes local version of something good, where we're always local, organic, certified organic, where possible. And at the end of it, he was like, I'm going to start a brewery. And I was like, well, I'm going to start a grocery delivery company. And some, a couple months later, I heard back from Ben, and he said, oh, well, I, I found a space. And I was like, great, I'll be a tenant. So that was about the level of genesis. And then I locked myself in here for a winter and built things out of wood. Um, and that's where a lot of this stuff comes from and kind of hacked it together. Um, you know, I, I bootstrapped because I was really tired of raising money, so a, our company was started with less than $100,000 uh, up until this point. We've raised very, very little money, and the reason for that was, one, it's hard to do it otherwise, and two, it allows you to actually focus on the business, and it forces you to do things that make money early on as opposed to spending lots of money and hoping someday that you'll make money based on an Excel model that is always going hyperbolically up. Um, so, I don't know. Yeah, so what were, tell us, like, you know, you built a lot of stuff out of wood, what happened next? <laughs> um, we, we started, I, it was really, organic in, in how we grew. We, we tried delivering things. It, it worked or didn't work. Uh, we, we had spoilage issues early on. We, we were trying to figure out, um, you know, how do you deliver things in three separate groups of temperature, room temperature, cold, and frozen, at the same time without buying specialized trucks for it that cost many thousands of dollars, and figuring out how to convince the regulatory entities that that was okay. Um, and so a lot of it was, I was running around trying to make room for people who actually did things to get it all done. Like I, I would go out and find the discounted freezers and build the counters and chase some money down and try to find opportunities and then I had to turn around and rely on the group of people uh, that I worked with to actually run a business. Because, um, I don't know, on paper I'm the CEO but in reality I just fetch resources. Um, that was my job function you know, make things available so that it can be moved forward by people who are actually um, doing all of the work of running a business. So who else is on your team and what do they do? Uh, so we, so there's, uh, we have three people that kind of make everything happen day to day. Um, one's Darren, um, so Darren runs all of our sourcing, so he manages all of our relationships with all of our suppliers, all of our inventory, everything that's coming in, when it's gonna go out. A lot of what we do is people, about half of the orders that we get are someone just saying, I am a vegetarian who also eats bacon, bring me food. <laughs> and, or, or some version of this. And this is beautiful for us because that means that every week we get to deal with what's in season what's an inventory, what's available, what's freshest, what's the most interesting thing we can find, rather than us having one order for haddock, pollock, ribeye, this and this and this. We, we do still have a lot of customers ordering individual items, but the bulk of what we do, we're able to constantly curate and make the, the square peg of what's available in local food fit through the round hole of this is what I would like if I was standing in Whole Foods right now. Um, and so that's, so he makes all of that work. Um, Nick is our one-man marketing department. Uh, you'll see him out on that tricycle giving out apples and high fives. 
and literally hugging people on the street because he's just one of those irrepress irrepressibly warm, loving people that never gets tired of explaining exactly what we do and why and why it's so great and understanding what you currently do for groceries and how this could fit into your life. And um, So just a one-man evangelist is kind of, I'd say, where half of our customer bases come from, the other half just being referrals. Um, and then Leah makes every, all the things get from A to B to C and make sure that we don't violate food safety laws and regulations and that everything's clean and dealt with. And, um, and then we have just a, a huge group of people that work part-time either driving or packing or uh, whatever else it might be. Um, and it's cool because most of them started out as customers and then said, could I just get food for free if I came in and like put things in bags for you? It's actually a great way to cannibalize your own customer base <laughs> if you're not careful about it. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of the core group of us. And then we have uh, friends who do writing and graphic design and things like this who've been kicking in basically sweat equity since day one. Um, I guess that's, that was, for me, going back to an earlier question, one of my biggest learnings is that as I look at a startup, there's no point in trying to hold on to all the equity. Um, it's very common for the first one or two, three, one, two or three people into a startup to own the vast majority of that company down the road. Um, at least of the founders and the you know the staff that are in it, and a venture capitalist might take a huge chunk out of that. But in general, you, you wind up with this highly disproportionate pie towards the, those key early people, and everybody else gets symbolic amounts of equity to motivate them. And I think that's terrible, um, personally. I, I, I gave out equity like, like heads at the start of this, and I think that's great to do. Investing, if, if uh, probably not the forum to explain the concept of vesting, but there's some wonderful controls that you can put on that early on to make sure that people aren't walking out having done nothing after a couple of months with you know a, a lot of that company. Uh, but I really love the idea of, of giving people a stake in something and just seeing if they own it and they dive into it and make it their own and really you know throw their heart and soul behind it. And everybody else just naturally selects, um, and that's been really neat. Uh, I think that. Hiring people when you don't have money is much easier than hiring people when you have a lot of money. Um, because the only people who show up are either crazy and desperate or really love what they're doing. And they're willing to come and make it, that happen and find a way to, to make that real. So, you know, for the first year or so that you do these things, it, it's really hard economically to make all the things connect if you're not gonna go raise a bunch of money. And you wind up with a very passionate, mission-driven group of people um, and I've been fortunate to have that. So. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about what the business model of Something Good is now, um, and maybe a few of the major tweaks that you made from you know there to here. Sure. Um, so our business model is really simple. You go online, you order things, um, either on a recurring basis or as a one-off, and then we bring them to you a couple days later. Um, that's, that's the core of our model. And we like it, we try really hard to encourage people to actually you know, embrace the variability that comes with local food so that we can bring you whatever actually is fresh and available rather than trying to get you that exact cut of meat. Um, and, it's, and a lot of people love it and some people hate that because they really know exactly what they want and those are not good customers for us. Um, people who like the variability and like to be, you know, experience new things and get recipe ideas and what the heck's monkfish and try cooking that this week. That's, that's a lot of the fun with it. Um, so that's, that's where we wound up uh, as a model. When we first started, we, we wanted to try to do whole diets um, where people would answer a survey of questions and then we'd say, great, all of your groceries, meal by meal, will be delivered, packaged like a uh, Blue Apron and delivered to your door. And that was where we started with it. And we realized the complexity of that would make it so that we never actually launched as a company. Um, and so, and we also, that's a really big sale to get somebody on for. They can't just try it for 50 bucks once and see how it goes. That's, that's a leap of faith into a company, which when you first start out is really tough to do. Um, in terms of tweaks, we made one recently. We didn't have a delivery fee for two years. Um, we had a voluntary one that 30% of our customers paid. Just literally, it was just like a shopping cart item with voluntary delivery fee. 
and people paid that, which I always thought was pretty cool. Um, and but ultimately, we, we finally just in the last week implemented a delivery fee for the very first time, so that it would actually we could pay drivers better um, and pay packers better for the time that they're there, uh, because it is if you're if 73 percent is your cost of goods, you have to be really creative to make the other 27 percent into profitable company. Ultimately, I think if this business is going to scale and be sustainable long term, it's probably going to be about 65% cost of goods is somewhere that we could be a long term viable, profitable company. Um, and that's still, if you talk to anyone who works in grocery, is an asinine assumption because it should be about 40% or less. Uh, but we just think that we can find a way to do it if we are creative on the rest of the business. So when you talk about the important things, like improving the business, um, which I think you're, you know, you're kind of getting into that direction now, what are some of the goals that you have that you would be working on if you weren't, oh, you know, that maybe you would be working on with more of your time if you weren't putting out fires? Well, I think that for us, you know, getting to about three times the scale that we're currently at starts to give us a lot of flexibility to do things that we'd love to do, like give all of our suppliers orders 12 months in advance so they can grow around that. Um, that's something that we want to get to. We'd like to buy the whole cow every single time and not only buy the most desirable parts, which is a really difficult thing. If you grow cattle for beef in Massachusetts or in general, anywhere, um, and you're not selling to a distributor who just buys the whole cow, if you're like seeing the people at the farmer's markets who are selling one cut at a time, 50% plus the animal winds up as hamburger. Everyone wants ribeyes. There are four tenderloins on a cow. That's what a lot of people only want and nothing else. Um, so we'd love to get to the point that we have the, the visibility and, and the, the scale that we could actually turn around and say, no, build another greenhouse, we'll invest in you to do that. You can get to a scale that's gonna make more sense for you. And you know, th that type of cash flow is really important, even at the scale we're at. So we're we're at the scale where we'll sell a little bit over a million dollars of food this year. And that's, that's awesome for a bootstrap business that's two years old, at least in my mind. Um, and even at that scale, buying $50,000 of yogurt from Sophia, Sophia's Greek Pantry in Belmont, is like life altering for anyone who's never been there. Um, I will give out samples at the end of this. It's like we sell more of it than vegetables sometimes. Um, but you know, buying $50,000 of yogurt from a one woman shop that's, that can be life-changing for them. And buying you know, the whole cow at a time for someone who otherwise has to sit in the market three days a week and not run their farm, that's really substantive for them. So, I mean, you, you can always kind of ride the slippery slope of if we were bigger, we could do more good, and that gets you to the point where you're Whole Foods and you're suddenly destroying grain markets in South America because quinoa is sexy right now. Um, but I think for us, if I could do anything, it would be to put the, time, put the resources in place to drive customer base to about three times the size of where we're at, because that's where we have the ability to look forward and invest more in our suppliers. So that's the biggest change that I'd like to be able to make. Okay, one more for me. Tell us a little bit about, I mean, does being in Boston or being in Somerville specifically play a role in your business? Well, um, it would be a lot harder to do any deliveries by bicycle if we were not in this immediate area. Um, something we'd love to do more of. But um, I guess the community of this has been, has been really valuable. Being in a place where people walk by you with a beer in their hand and just consider what you do for a while as opposed to being an ad on the side of the T is a really nice thing, getting to have the human interaction and the direct contact of people just having to, like already being in a place like this has been wonderful. I've gotten to tell our story thousands of times, one person at a time, have pe drag people into a creepy walk-in fridge and feed them all kinds of food. And I think that there's, there's something really unique about that and something that's, that's been really wonderful for us about being, not necessarily in Somerville, but in a place like Aeronaut, where, where especially as more of the businesses here uh, start to gear up, um, you know, our hydroponic microgreens 
uh, farm, not us, it's not our company, uh, but Bloombrick, you know, with them opening up, that's awesome. We can source some of our like greens from 30 feet that way, <laughs> as opposed to from South Hadley. Um, and that's not to say there's anything wrong with, with Hadley, Massachusetts, but there's just like a, <laughs> sorry, did I? <laughs> I like Hadley. I love yeah. it. Hadley yeah. has the best asparagus in the world. <laughs> Hadley grass, they call it. But, you know, having these direct, very, you know, personal relationships with other small businesses where we can take, you know, oh, we can co-buy with them because it wouldn't make sense for the farm to come if they were just buying, if, if Peter was just buying one 50 pound bag of potatoes, but it makes sense because we're also buying six more. So the type of co-sourcing, you know, where we've bought butternut squash in, in bulk buys with aeronauts so they could make butternut squash beers and that helps justify that truck roll for that farm in a lot of cases. So I think, I mean, Somerville in particular, we, I, I, we could probably do the same thing in Cambridge, um, where we can throw a rock into Cambridge from here, so I hope that's not a, a, a terrible thing to say. Um, but it's been a very welcoming community of people who are really mission-driven around these types of startups, and that's been great. And being in a facility like this one around the group of people that come here has been even better.